When I was at university, I took a part-time job at a local bar. I'd usually opt for closing shifts so I could fit my shifts around lectures and study. I'd been working there for around two semesters, and in a university town, I'd seen my fair share of Saturday night drunken brawls. That didn't faze me too much as a six-foot guy, especially as there were always doormen working the night shifts. That isn't to say that I didn't encounter some belligerent patrons from time to time. One customer, though, and one night, I will never forget. It was a busy Saturday night, and the bar was packed with students. I was juggling multiple drink orders when an old, greasy-looking man tried to grab my attention. He wasn't concerned with the other drinks I was making or the other customers I was serving. I was handing a drink to a girl at the bar when the guy snagged my shirt sleeve and said, Give me a stemma, would you, mate? I was a little annoyed that he was grabbing my shirt and that he had no concept of patience. His speech was slightly slurred, though, so I figured he was just a drunk asshole who had lowered inhibitions. I looked at him and told him to give me a few minutes while I completed the drinks orders I was already making. He just gave me this exaggerated, toothy grin. And when I say toothy, they were barely all there. I was busy enough that I didn't take in his whole appearance this time, but I did immediately register the stereotypical creeper-style glasses he had on, and his eyes pretty blatantly staring me all over. But I didn't dwell on it at that moment, and went on fixing the drinks. As I was pulling a pint for another patron, I heard his leery voice over the noise of the pub, making an inappropriate remark to one of the girls who was waiting for her drink. She seemed uncomfortable and kept edging further away from him, but so far, the comments seemed to be just unwanted flirtation from a dirty old man. I figured, the quicker I fixed her drinks, the sooner she could rejoin her friends at the table. He kept making lewd remarks, though, and the more uncomfortable she got, the more he seemed to take pleasure in it. I tried to make the drinks as quickly as possible, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was really off with this guy. After the girl went back to her table, and as I went about my work, his eyes followed me around the bar, and as irrational as it was, I began to feel a sense of unease. As the night progressed, he put away more and more drinks, downing them far too quickly for a guy sitting alone at a bar. Each time I gave him his order, he would lean in and take a deep breath. He began to watch my every move. It didn't take long for him to start making veiled threats and insinuations. Something about wanting to take me out back. Many customers are aggressive, rude, and even made sexual remarks, but never with this level of insinuated violence, and without any wavering when I told him to fuck off. I was relieved when closing time arrived, and as the other customers started to leave, I thought maybe I would get some peace to perform close down, but the man lingered, refusing to leave. He became belligerent, hurling insults at me when I refused to follow him into the toilet or out back. I kept refusing him and telling him firmly to leave, at which point he would stop barking at me for just a moment before he began muttering to himself. He started talking about taking me to a secluded place and how he would cause me harm if I didn't want to have some fun with him. At this point, I was feeling disgusted. The guy was between me and the exit, the other staff members, or the bouncers who were still smoking outside. I'd thrown some punches before, but looking at this guy, I wasn't sure he wouldn't be able to overpower me. I decided I would slip into the back and call one of my colleagues. I made some comment about fetching the mop, but as soon as I started to walk to the end of the bar, the guy got up off his stool and began to follow me, muttering some really disgusting shit under his breath. I told him to stay where he was, but he just grinned at me. I reached for the bar phone to call for help, but the man noticed and lunged at me, pinning my arm to the bar digging his long fingernails and slumping his inebriated body down on top of it. He started to sniff me. What the fuck? And I was no longer putting up with this shit. 
I was so weirded out and ready to send the sick fuck on his way. I grabbed a bottle of vodka from the bar and smashed it against his greasy ass head. He stumbled back onto the floor, stunned, giving me the chance to get my arm back and make a break for the exit. I told the bouncers that the guy was a pervert, and as he broke through the doors behind me a moment later, they blocked his exit. He was shouting at this point, You should feel fucking privileged. He flicked his tongue out like a snake and started smacking his lips. One of the doormen grabbed him by the arm and remarked to me, and the other doorman that had seen this guy here every Friday and Saturday night. He'd remembered the days, as he thought how odd it was that this guy was here by himself, alone, wearing an ill-fitting suit, soiled yellow, in a bar full of students on the weekend. And as he began to take note of him, he noticed every time he saw him, he'd be sitting there, nursing a barely touched pint, staring at me as I worked the bar. I guess that night, he finally got the courage to sit at the bar and make his advances. The bouncers threatened him and told him not to come back. I told my manager, who ultimately banned him from the bar, but I never did report it to the police. I figured visiting a public bar every weekend wouldn't equate to a stalking charge. I quit that shitty job soon after anyway, in favor of a job at the university that was much better paid. I just hope he doesn't pull the same stuff on a girl or guy more vulnerable, and who doesn't have a bottle of Smirnoff to hand. I used to work at an old vet slash biker bar just for cash tips. It was always the same guys coming in, playing pool, or watching the game. There was one guy, Harold, that was there pretty frequently. He was a bit younger than the rest of the crowd, but you could tell he'd done some drugs in the past or something, because his brain seemed fried. One night I'm closing up and he's still there. It wasn't unusual for people to stay over and smoke with us after we locked up, so I didn't think anything of it. He mentioned that he didn't have a way to get home, so we would probably have to walk. I asked him where he lived, and it turns out it was right across from my apartment complex. So I told him I would give him a ride. We were just joking in the car when we pulled onto his street, Suddenly he looks at me seriously and he says, Are you scared? I was like, Well, I wasn't until you said that. And we both laughed awkwardly and he got out of the car. It creeped me out a lot. I ended up quitting the next day for unrelated reasons. Then he died the next week in the bar, so it was really weird. When I was in my early 20s, I went to university in Seattle. I was living with friends near UW and working part-time in a little brew pub in Madrona on the edge of the Central District, aka the CD. In those days, pre-gentrification, the CD was a multicultural neighborhood full of families, great food, lots of music and friendly people. I liked it that the bus dropped me off in the CD. I had to walk about 10 blocks or 15 minutes to get to the brew pub where I worked. The pub was at the top of the hill where the CD turned into Madrona. Every day while walking, I passed a group of kids I'd say hi to, an Egyptian taxi rank where I'd say hi, and I think people were starting to recognize me. Oh. It's just that blonde girl that walks up the hill to her job. But walking back to the bus at night, 15 minutes in the dark with empty streets, didn't feel quite the same. It was a moderately high crime area. So my ex-boyfriend Ben 
would meet me for a beer at the end of my shift and walk me back. One evening we were arguing. It seemed Ben had possibly slept with his ex-girlfriend. So, I was walking out ahead of him, a full two blocks, while he clung his head in shame behind me, carrying his board under his arm. I saw a car pass me going the opposite direction. It was going slowly, but I paid it little mind as I was pretty pissed. I still remember it was a long car, white and shiny, a low rider. Suddenly I heard skateboard wheels going fast on concrete, and out of nowhere the car was pulled up to the curb right beside me. Four guys got out simultaneously. They pulled a U-turn in the middle of the street to come up on me. Ben saw it before I had, and it caught up, skating fast. They were rushing me. But dear Ben was there with the skateboard held high. Oh, is she with you? You should walk closer to her in this neighborhood, they said. And that was it. They got back in their car, turned around again, and headed back up the hill. If he hadn't been there, I don't know what would have happened, but I doubt it would have been good. They almost had me surrounded by the time Ben arrived, waving his skateboard around, and each of them were twice my size. I later heard that there was a significant amount of forced sex work and sex trafficking in the area, and I would have fetched a good price. I pretty much forgave Ben on the spot. He had saved my life after all. But those other four guys, let's never meet again. I used to be naively helpful to all sorts of strangers and often picked up hitchhikers solo and in groups and get them to where they needed to go. When I was 19, I moved into Huntington, a college town in West Virginia, and I worked at a popular bar. My shift would start around 9pm and end at about 2am. I didn't know anybody in this town, or stayed even, and I'd been there on my own for only a month or so. One of these nights, one of the customers had taken an interest in conversing with me while I was working my shift. Me. Being a good employee, conversed pleasantly back. He was in his thirties or forties, buzzed white hair with a group of other guys, all of them tattooed and with leather jackets. He'd been there going back and forth between them at their table and me at the bar, pretty much talking to me non-stop for a good couple of hours. Around 1.30am, he mentions he doesn't know where his friends went. I look up, oblivious and see the whole bar had virtually cleared out. He was right, not one of his buddies was in sight. He says they must have all gotten drunk and forgotten about him, leaving him there. The man is clearly bummed in concern, because as he tells me, he lives almost an hour away from here, and he has no way of getting home now. It's the middle of winter, so it's snowing pretty hard. He spends the next few minutes on the phone calling the different friends that were at the bar with him, but no one is answering. He's clearly fucked. I can't leave him in the bar. I can't in good conscience leave the man out in the snow. So fuck, now I've got to drive this stranger home in a place I'm unfamiliar with, in conditions I've never really driven before. I tell him don't worry. When I finish clearing the bar and closing up, I'll take him home. And I do. We get in the car and he gives me directions as we go. We're talking casually like we had been, just superficial conversation, nothing even hinting at sexual or flirty. I'm not a flirty person, so I'm positive there was no misunderstanding here. Keep in mind, it's like two in the morning. No one knows where I am or that I'm with this random guy, and it's snowing heavily. As we're chatting, suddenly I feel his hand on the back of my neck. It was such an unpleasant feeling. I remember his fingers swirling at the little hairs at the bottom of my hairline, which were too short to make it in the ponytail. 
Uh, I scrunched my neck and just calmly said, I have a knife. As I kept looking forward at driving, the swirling ceased, but the hand lingered on my skin. Again, calmly but more firmly, I said, I have a knife. He removed his hand and we kept driving. I figured whatever that was is handled and we get back into our conversation. Minutes later, I feel his hand fully against the back of my neck. His fingers wrapped gently around its curve. I scrunched my neck again and said, Seriously, I have a knife. I have a knife. He removed his hand once more and then in a very hurt tone he said, Oh, you really scared of me. After that, he kept his hands to himself. It was a long one-hour drive, but I got him home and I took off. I'm 29 now, and it wasn't until many years later did it occur to me that the whole thing was probably a setup he and his friends had planned. They probably left him stranded so that the chick he's been talking to all night will have to take him home opening the door for sex, consensual or maybe even not. The moral of the story, don't let people you don't know in your car, and also carry a knife. This happened when I was a bartender about four years ago but I think about it often and it's changed the way I operate throughout life. I now refuse to go to any store alone after midnight. For the story's sake, I will tell you that I was 25 and an attractive and slender blonde at the time. On a busy Friday night, I was bartending with the bar manager and he had noticed that we were very low on some bar necessities after the dinner rush. So I was sent out to go to a 24-hour grocery store down the road to pick up the odds and ends that we would require to get us through the weekend. I picked up everything that was asked of me without trouble at the store, until I got to the liquor aisle. There were two country-looking guys that were probably around my age in the aisle, and they were staring at me and whispering to each other in a way that made me uncomfortable, as I assumed they were making comments about me. All pretty innocent so far. Before they could approach me, I grabbed what I needed very quickly and power walked to the self-checkout. I really booked it out of there because when you're a bartender, it's kind of like you're on a stage and are required to be charming and interact with people that you otherwise absolutely wouldn't be able to tolerate unless you're getting paid to, thus why I'm not a bartender anymore. I get to the self-checkout and hot on my tail are the two guys. I'm scanning my stuff and they use the scanning station next to me. I get a better look at them now that they're right next to me. One is taller, muscular, and average looking. The other is shorter and more plump. They both look dirty, and their eyes were completely bloodshot. I'm not sure if they were high on something or had already been drinking for a while. They continue to stare at me, and our eyes awkwardly met. So I did the pleasant, midwesterny thing to do and flashed them a quick half-assed closed-lipped smile to be polite. The taller one starts trying to talk to me. Hey, looks like you're ready to party, huh? I replied with something like, something like that, it's not for me though. They walk closer to me and ignore the responsibility to scan their items. Oh, must be for your boyfriend, huh? I flash the awkward, tight-lipped smile again and roll my eyes slightly. Like this is your hint that I'm not interested, fellas. The taller one continues to try to talk to me. You could come hang out with us tonight. We could show you a really good time, if you know what I mean. I reply with, no thanks, I'm good. I have plans already. Well, the tall one starts getting upset that his moves aren't working like he'd hoped and starts using a more threatening tone and moves very close to me. He's like two inches away, but I ignore him, staying focused on the scanner. I don't think he had showered in a few days by the smell of him. He gets a bit louder and says, I see how it is. You probably only fuck doctors and rich men like that. 
You think you're too good for us. We can show you that you aren't. We can teach you a lesson. Now I'm not sure in what context he meant, but it definitely wasn't good. Still not looking at him, I turn away so my body is blocking his view of my purse, which I set on the counter to grab my 4-inch pocket knife out and slide it up my sleeve in case I need to protect myself, acting like I'm searching for my wallet. I do this, however, in view of the self-scan worker standing at a podium, and look at her with wide eyes, trying to communicate that I do not feel safe and I might need help. I turn back to the machine and slide my credit card to pay, while the creepy and hostile guys are practically standing on top of me. The machine malfunctions and starts beeping. The lady worker comes over immediately, and the guys standing next to me change their expressions from... I'm planning to torture you for a couple of days and toss your body in a creek. To just your good old country boys making polite conversation over here. They actually tried to act like I knew them and we were friends, so the worker wouldn't be alerted to their ill intentions. They tried joking with the worker, saying I was stealing something and that's why the machine went off. The worker was definitely not buying it. She was a six foot plus tall woman with some muscle on her by the way. I wouldn't mess with her on my best day. Anyways, she presses a few buttons on the screen, shooting the guys a very unimpressed look when they were trying to act charming, and cancels the order completely. She turns to me and says, I'm sorry for the inconvenience, ma'am. This machine seems to be not working correctly. Why don't you gather your things and I will ring you up at an actual register? She puts her hand on my back and gives me a wide-eyed look like I gave her a minute earlier letting me know that she sees I'm in danger. I pick up my things to follow her to a register that's very near the security office. The guys linger around the self-scan, still glaring at me, and they eventually complete their purchase. But they stand at the exit, I assume waiting for me. I felt like I would be walking to my death if I made my exit in that moment. The worker keeps a close eye on the guys and scans my items. As she's scanning, she tells me there really wasn't anything wrong with the machine I was using. It just misread my credit card. She said, I had a bad feeling about those guys from the moment they walked in, and then I saw them getting aggressive towards you. I already rang security to be ready to walk out to the parking lot and make sure you left safely when you were ready to leave. Then I saw you take that knife out and put it in your sleeve, getting ready to protect yourself. Good girl. As much as I'd like to see you show them they picked the wrong chick to mess with, I'm glad I was able to pull you aside and make sure you're safe. I see them waiting by the door for you. I'll just keep pressing buttons on the screen and act like I'm having trouble with your order until they give up and go outside. Our security officer and I are both going to escort you to your vehicle when you leave. I thought to myself, this woman seriously deserves a raise. I thanked her over and over again, told her what they said to me, and I was getting afraid because I don't know what these guys are capable of. As I'm talking to her, my bar manager calls me to see what's taking so long. I explain what was happening, and he was obviously very concerned and ready to come up there himself and kick some ass. By the time I hang up, the guys had given up and walked out to the parking lot. The worker said to give it another few minutes because she had a feeling they may still be in the parking lot waiting for me to walk out and see which vehicle was mine so they could follow me. My instant thought was, no way, they have to be gone by now. I was wrong. The worker and security guard escort me out and as it was after midnight, you can imagine how empty the parking lot was. Towards the back of the lot, there sat an old, big pickup truck, running with the lights on, pointed towards the store. It was a huge parking lot, and it wouldn't have made sense for them to initially park like that, so I'm assuming they moved the truck to sit that way so they had a full view of when I exited the store to go to my vehicle. It was like being stopped by very hungry lions. When I unlocked my car, and they saw that me, the worker, and the guard were looking directly at them, and that I wasn't getting in my car until we watched them leave. They then peeled out of the parking lot, 
I mean they seriously did a burnout to establish that they were pissed and trying to intimidate us or something. Oh, poor creeps didn't get their way. Boo-hoo. I thank the worker and the guard over and over again, as I am certain they just saved my life, or at least saved me from having to live with whatever those guys were planning on doing to me. I did write a long letter to the store manager and to their corporate location, describing how their employees protected me and how grateful I was. I really hope that earned her a promotion, bonus, or raise. She didn't know me at all and was ready to protect me, which really isn't part of her job, but she did it anyway. Needless to say, I do not go late night shopping by myself anymore. I never will again. I still kick myself over this. So about 10 years ago, I was a lowly graduate working in a local pub for extra cash. It was a proper East End old man's pub, the type that is rapidly disappearing. The drinks were cheap and the locals were in every night for a chat. I loved it. It was great fun. One night I was working and this huge guy comes in, seriously, like fill the doorframe large. As with all my locals, he immediately got a nickname, Meathead. He proceeded to spend the night propping up the bar, drinking and making small talk, telling me that he's moved back into the area after some time away. As the night went on, he got progressively more drunk and started telling me about how his wife had divorced him, how badly she had treated him, and how hard he had worked as a lorry driver to keep her happy. As a bar manager, I was pretty used to these sort of sob stories, and I saw it as part of my job to lend an empathetic ear. I had also recently experienced the very traumatic breakdown of a long-term relationship, so I was happy to have someone to complain about my ex to. I guess we all know where this is going, right? Yeah, he started coming in all the time, and yes, he got overly friendly, but honestly, as any female who has ever worked in a pub will tell you, this is standard practice. All you have to do to warrant this type of attention is pull the pints and have female anatomy, so it didn't really give me any concern. That was until he started waiting for me after work to walk me home. I didn't want him to do this, but he wouldn't really take no for an answer, and I thought that given I only lived about 20 meters from the pub, with three other people, it would be okay. Wrong. Shortly after he started walking me home after every shift, his behavior in the pub got worse. He would get more drunk and sometimes even threaten other customers for looking at me the wrong way. I started to get my flatmates to come and meet me after shift so that he didn't need to walk me home. Eventually, he started a big fight in the pub on a Saturday night punched two security guards and got barred. I, by this time, was looking for a better paid job for the summer. I got offered a new one in the city, more money and better tips. I was relieved and for a while I didn't see him. Okay, so here comes the stupid. After our exams, my friends and I went out and got smashed. I mean really, really smashed. We were in this bar opposite my house, and out of nowhere, this guy appears. Explaining that I just finished my final exams, he buys a bottle of champagne, and in my drunken stupor, like an idiot, I drank that too. Inevitably, he tried to kiss me, and I stupidly allowed it to happen. Then he starts crying, saying how much he liked me and how much he'd miss me. I could barely even stand up. At this point, my flatmate, who knew what a creep this guy had been, drags me off and says, What are you doing? We're going home. He follows us out of the bar and asks me for my phone number. I said, well, more like slurred, that I'd made a mistake, that I had a boyfriend now and that I shouldn't have done that, that I wasn't going to give him my phone number. He went mental, screaming and crying and calling me, 
yet another dirty whore, calling me all sorts of obscenities. So we ran over the road and into our house. Next day, bang, bang, bang at the door. My flatmate goes to answer it, and it's Meathead. She told him I wasn't there, and he goes away. Same thing the next day and the day after, until after about a week, I shouted out the window to him that if he didn't leave, I'd call the police. Then the letter started, then the flowers. I should have gone to the police, but I blamed myself for what was happening, if I hadn't been so stupid. Anyway, two of my flatmates were Italian, and as their semester had finished, they'd moved out. Then my other flatmate went traveling around South America, leaving me alone in the house for three weeks before I moved out. I was freaking out, and so I spent a lot of time staying at a friend's and avoided being in the house on my own. Eventually, however, I had to go and get some new clothes and do the washing and that kind of thing. I came home to find that my flat had been broken into, so I phoned the police. They'd asked me to check what had been taken, when I realized that not only had nothing been taken, but the only thing out of place was my underwear drawer being open, and my bed looking like it had been slept in, I finally lost it and told the police what happened. They said they would look into Meathead, and in the meantime, I gathered my things and moved out into another area of London. When they got back in touch, what they said absolutely floored me. Meathead had not been away. He had been in prison for the attempted murder of his wife. So, Meathead, I imagine you're probably back in prison now. Let's not meet again. Last summer, I worked at this really great pub and was the closing server. Me, the bartender, and one of the kitchen guys were just sort of puttering about to finish the clothes, and a customer walks in. It's pretty well last call, but he offers to buy us all a drink. My co-workers accept. I had to drive, so I said no thanks. The guy was nice enough at first. He was making small talk and asking me what I'm doing with life. At the time, I'd just been accepted to my master's program, so I told him that and he called me a liar. Okay, I don't know why I would lie about that, but whatever. Then he started getting really weird. He kept insisting that he's a really nice guy, but he started using all these really unsettling homophobic slurs. We tried to get him out of the restaurant subtly, because at this point, it was clear the guy was unstable. I was sitting next to him at the bar when he turned to me, and out of the blue he said, I'm going to kill all of you, and again uses a homophobic slur. I immediately got up and said, I need to use the washroom, and Power walked out to my car, locked myself in, and called the cops. While I was gone, my two co-workers got the guy out, but I've never felt that flight response so quickly in my life. Everything was fine in the end, but damn, it was scary. This happened a few years ago, and sometimes I still have nightmares where I don't manage to get away. Let me start off by saying, I live in a pretty big city, lots of bars and clubs, and I have experience with partying and drugs. I have been in blackout drunk situations, and this was not that. I no longer go out on my own. That night, I decided to go out with some friends, bar hopping. I mainly knew only one of the girls that I hung out with on the regular. The other two were more acquaintances or strangers. I was very outgoing and loved meeting people, so that was nothing new for me. We had a few drinks at a bar and continued on to the next one, having fun and great times. One of the girls I didn't know well pulled out the party stuff sometime during our second bar visit. I decided to skip it because I wasn't looking to get effed up that night. My friend said yes, and she and the third girl went to the bathroom. 
The second girl, Barb, kept saying I should go with the two others. I declined and declined. She got a bit aggressive and mean after the third time I declined. My friend came back just then and Barb acted like nothing had just happened. We had some new guys join our group to flirt. I'm in a relationship, but my friend and Barb were not. By then, the second girl had left. Barb and my friend were starting to get pretty messed up. I went to use the bathroom and to text my boyfriend that I was coming home soon and saw that my phone was dead. When I came back, the guys had gotten us shots. I was still pretty sober and declined the shot. Barb shoved the shot into my hand and to avoid a scene, I took it. I started to tell my friend I was heading home, but one look at her face and Barb, I saw they were out of it. I was starting to feel pretty woozy myself, so I grabbed my things and their things and started shoving them to go. The guys that bought the shots were protesting, but I wasn't getting resistance from the girls. I hailed a cab, and I remember putting the girls in the back and telling the driver that we were dropping off my friends at their house, then going to my address. I then blacked out. I remember dropping off my friend, then a blackout. Then I was alone with that driver. I was in the front seat and he was holding my hand. I looked around, disoriented, took in the sight of him holding my hand while driving like my boyfriend would. I saw my wallet in the center cup holder. The meter was off and he was telling me that he was taking me to a romantic place. When I told him no, please take me home. My boyfriend was waiting at home. He said something along the lines of, Stop talking about him. I told you. Which to me, in hindsight, indicates that I'd already told him many times. He said he just wanted to pretend for a bit and he held my hand tighter. I didn't want to trigger a violent reaction. So I left my hand there and started to reach for my wallet with my other hand. He saw, let go of my hand and took my wallet from the cup holder to his other side where I couldn't reach. I was still woozy and blacked out again. When I came to my senses, we parked near a very known, romantic and touristy location in my city. Normally this place is packed, not that night. It's pretty far from anything else too, and surrounded by woods. I started to cry and tell him to please take me home. I want to see my boyfriend. That I won't tell anyone. Please. He looked at me and said, I will take you home if you pretend you are my girlfriend for a bit. I sat there in shock. I wished my brain wasn't adult. I wished I'd never gone out. I wished I could see my boyfriend for the thousandth time that night. I said okay. He smiled, put my wallet back in the cup holder. I took it slowly and put it under my leg. He took my hand and looked out the front window, out into the little lake he had brought me to. He started talking, and I don't remember what he was saying. I was trying not to black out again. I waited for him to look at me and asked again, Please take me home. He said if I let him give me a kiss. I said no. He looked mad for a fraction of a second and squeezed the hand he was still holding. He leaned in fast and kissed me anyway. I kept my lips sealed tight against him, ready to fight, ready to bite and scratch and not go down easy. He let go of my hand and backed away. He started the car and started our way back to civilization. I was crying as silently as possible, trying not to be heard so he would forget I was there and want to touch me. Hold my hand. I waited till we were near enough people that I could bolt out of the car and find another way home. I think he saw me grabbing my wallet from under my leg and knew my intention to jump out at the next red light. He snatched it again and said he would drive me. I just nodded, but by then I didn't care about the wallet, my phone, or anything else. I'm jumping out. No matter what, I was going to get home. I didn't know what time it was by then. I do know there was almost no cars driving in my usual busy city. No buses, no people. I didn't care anymore. He stopped at a red light. I unlocked the door and yanked it open and ran. 
I didn't look back, but I heard a car peel out of the intersection. He was running too. My phone still dead, no wallet, so no money, really far from my house. I was still drowsy and crying. I had no idea of the time. I started walking home. I heard a car pull up near me and started running out of instinct. I heard a woman's voice yell out, Are you okay? I stopped and swirled around, and the most beautiful person I'd ever seen in the world was walking towards me slowly, hands out in front of her so as not to scare me. I started crying even harder, even more incoherent than I'd ever been in my life. She hugged me so hard and asked for my boyfriend's number. She called him. He answered right away. She started telling him where I was, that I was okay, that she was taking me home. I cried the whole way back, trying to explain what happened, but still woozy, still freaking out. It was hard, so we drove in relative silence. When we got home, my boyfriend was outside losing his mind. My savior gave me a phone number to call when I felt better, and then drove off. It was 5 a.m. I left the bar at 10 p.m. That's all I can remember. A week later, my wallet showed up in my mailbox. So yeah, taxi driver, I hope we never meet again. I'm not really sure where to start this story. I met this guy, Greg, through some mutual friends, and everyone I knew seemed to like him. He was a goofy kid with long hair, nobody you'd really think twice about. He started hanging around with some of my friends and I, and eventually he was part of my main group of friends. I was in and out of a long-term relationship, and at the time I was single. Greg and I flirted for a little while, but I grew disinterested pretty quickly. I was mostly worried about ruining my small group of friends and figured a fling with Greg wasn't worth that. A good few months into our friendship, I go across country with my sister and I'm away for around two months. During the months I'm away, Greg messages me constantly and starts saying really possessive things to me and my sister. For example, one time I told him about how we were going swimming in California, and he told me he will kill any guy who saw me on the beach in a bikini. This was creepy, but I was 3,000 miles away and I didn't really think about it. This is where it got really weird. He sent me a Snapchat saying, I'm going to do this for you. I didn't open it right away, so as I clicked again, there was already another picture. Him holding a chunk of his hair. The next picture, him with a mullet. The picture after, half bust hair with tiny bald spots. And another one, completely bald. Then a black screen that said, you made me do this. Then the next picture, and I'm not kidding you, he shaved his head and his eyebrows. I was in California and in shock and I called him. I was looking to comfort him, thinking he was obviously having some sort of breakdown. I mean he had absolutely beautiful long hair before this. Before I could even get a word in, he was screaming at me saying this was my fault. He basically said I'd gotten into his brain like a worm and it made him shave his eyebrows. I basically blocked him on everything at that point. I was across the country and that was the last thing I needed in my life at that time. There was a few more weird things, but flash forward to when I'm back from my cross-country trip. We didn't have any classes together, but one of our classes shared a hallway in my school. I'd barely spoken to him since his outburst shaving his eyebrows. He stood outside my classroom door staring at me, saying nothing. And I mean blatantly staring through the door, not even trying to look inconspicuous. I went outside and told him to leave. And he said nothing, so I just quickly went back inside. When he stayed there, staring, I went out again and was a bit more aggressive this time. I told him to get the fuck away from me. He told me he wouldn't leave unless I gave him a place we could talk. 
I just told him when my period's over and to leave. He snapped at me. No, a place and a time. You better fucking be there. I panicked and basically told him to meet me outside my classroom door at the time my class ends. I never did meet him. I left out the back door. I know this is getting a bit long, but this is possibly the worst part of my whole situation with Greg. He was driving me home after all this happened. He seemed less hostile and like he genuinely wanted to talk and apologize. My house is around 20 minutes away for reference. So we made it almost all the way home, and he starts acting sporadic again. He asks me very calmly if he should drive full speed into the speed limit sign. Before I can say anything, he turns his wheel going 70 miles per hour towards the sign. There's tears in my eyes, and he's just glancing at me, smiling. He continues his calm yet twitchy and sporadic demeanor, and calmly says, <laughs> Just kidding. At the last minute, turning back onto the road. At this point, my whole body is tingling and I'm about to cry. But we're only five minutes from my house. As he gets off the exit, something in him changes. He takes a long pause at the end of the exit and suddenly whirls his head towards me. You're not going home. I was stunned at first, but I argue with him and tell him he needs to take me home and that he's being fucking mental. Give me five good reasons why you want to go home. Obviously, I refuse to list reasons and start screaming at him to take me home. By this point, he's flipped around and gotten back onto the highway towards his house. I'm in a full-out panic and plead with him to take me home while the whole time he mumbles to himself. He kept talking to himself and saying, This isn't crazy, right? How bad is this? Then he'd answer himself like, No, no, it's fine. It's not that crazy. Which the whole time I'm pleading for him to take me home in the background. There was 20 minutes of this, so I don't know the exact dialogue. But I remember this. After I started crying, he says, No, it's okay. I have work, so I'll bring you to my house and leave you in my room. If you want, I'll give you some art stuff. Would you like that? Some stuff to paint with. He was talking to me like a child, and this is what really fucked me up for some reason. That just sounded like something a psychopath would say, and I stopped crying completely. I was cold now, and I barely spoke because I was trembling. He took me to his house and brought me inside. He left immediately and I was alone in his dark house, trying to take in what just happened. I wasn't planning on going anywhere. My phone was at like 5%. I called my sister, bawling, and she paid for an Uber, and within four minutes, I was on my way home. After that, I don't know why I didn't go to the police. I guess I felt bad for him, obviously, because he was fucking crazy. But this is the reason I'm writing this. All of this happened a few months ago, and I've successfully avoided him up until this point. But yesterday, an anonymous edible arrangement came. The card was completely empty, and I called everyone in my family trying to figure out who sent me an $80 basket of fruit. So I called the place and asked what the name was on the credit card. And I'm sure you can guess it. Greg. But why? If it was an apology... Why leave it anonymous? He had no intention of me finding out. It just doesn't make sense. This happened a few years ago. I have had a lot of problems in my life, but one is my OCD with keeping things clean and neat. With that being said, I have to do a full cleaning of my car each week. It's always been this way, and when I mean cleaning my car, it has to be hand washed at the car wash, dried down with no watermarks, vacuumed and inside wiped down. Once that is done, I must either wax or clay bar it when I get home, so I normally spend a decent amount of time at the car wash, and I actually enjoy this as a time to clear my head. 
I'm a fairly thinner woman who looks like she can't handle herself, but I have a second degree black belt in judo, so I don't get scared off or offended easily by people or things. So now onto the story. It was at the end of the working week, and I decided that it would be perfect to go to the car wash to clean it. Now the car wash that I normally go to is a bit farther away, so in that case I'll go to my second favorite car wash. As I'm finishing washing my car, I pull up to dry the car off. How the car wash is set up, it's in a sort of rural area, and not many people go there, especially 7.30 in the evening. The only thing around is a pizza place about a quarter of a mile down the road. So I'm sitting there, drying off my car, and an older woman pulls up to vacuum her car. As I look over to see who has pulled up, I notice a beat-up older white car sitting in the far stall of the car wash that I haven't noticed when I pulled up originally. There was an unkempt man sitting in the car, just staring at me. So normal people would have left by that point, feeling uncomfortable. But no, not me. I stayed because I didn't want my car to have watermarks, and I also thought maybe I'm just overreacting as well. So I continued and kept an eye on the car, thinking maybe he was just looking for change in his car for the car wash. Well, he wasn't. He stayed there for 20 minutes just watching me, not even getting out of his car. This is when I started feeling really uncomfortable and decided maybe it's time to wrap things up. So I started putting my products away, and this is when he got out of the car. I said, fuck this. As I'm locking my car doors and putting my car into drive, I noticed that the older woman who pulled in after me stayed and was watching this guy's every move. She left when I left, so I guess that other woman might have caught on to him or even saw something that I didn't notice, and she waited with me until I was finished with my car. It only took about five minutes for her to vacuum her car, so shout out for the lady having my back and being a nice person, regardless of what that guy's intentions were. I go to university two hours away by ferry from the mainland where my family lives. Sometimes on the weekends, I would go to visit them, which would require me to take a 23-kilometer bus ride to the ferry terminal. The bus ride was usually very boring and long, so I would try to make the best of it. Where I live, we have double-decker buses, and I would always sit at the top and listen to music. One Friday, on my way to the terminal, I was at the top level as usual when a man who looked to be about 40 came up to sit. I made note of his presence, but didn't think much of him other than that. He looked pretty beat up. Shaggy hair, stained brown hoodie, a silver chain on his neck. But I try not to judge. It's important to note at the time, I was 18 years old and I'm a small female. I don't ever want to have to be hyper aware or judgmental but I was brought up to always take note of who's around me, particularly men, just for safety. The man sat multiple rows ahead of me, and in the beginning, was initially minding his own business. I was just listening to music and looking out the window, minding mine. It wasn't until part way into the trip that I noticed he'd moved one row closer to me. Weird, but whatever. Maybe his seat was dirty or something. He then proceeded to move closer and closer until he was in the seat directly in front of me. It's important to know that on the top level of the bus is only him and I. Suffice to say, I was getting uncomfortable. Still giving him the benefit of the doubt, I decided to phone a friend and have a conversation just to break the uncomfortable silence. So I text my friend, SOS and he calls me and starts a normal conversation. It was at this point that the man decides that he wants to start talking to me. I tell my friend to hold on, and I take out one of my earbuds to hear what he's saying. He starts asking me if I know a good place to get a haircut. I say I don't. I start to put my earbuds back in when he asks what a girl like me 
is doing taking this bus alone. It wasn't late yet, but it was getting dark, so maybe he was just concerned for my safety. I don't know. I told him I was going to the ferry terminal. I again try to put my earbuds back in. He continues on, telling me his life story. About how he was in the military, how his kids don't talk to him, showed me his dog tag and told me he rides this bus back and forth every day just to have something to do. He has no intention of taking the ferry though. He's growing increasingly annoyed that I'm not reciprocating the conversation. He tells me it's quite rude to ignore people when they're just trying to have a friendly conversation. At this point, I'm starting to get quite creeped out. I politely inform him that I'm not trying to ignore him, but I'm on the phone with someone and would like to resume my conversation. This irritates him and he asks who I'm talking to, to which I respond, a friend. He notices a male name on my phone and makes a weird face. He tells me to hang up, then asks to see my phone to find a hair salon where he can get his hair cut cheaply, which I obviously refuse. I then get up and try to move to the bottom level of the bus so that I'm not secluded with this weirdo upstairs alone anymore. My friend on the phone has no clue what's going on as I collected my stuff and start moving. He tries to tell me it's not my stop yet, but I ignored him. I go down to the front of the lower level and stand near the bus until we reach the final stop. The man had come down the stairs and seated himself close by, but didn't try to talk to me further. I thought it was over, but no, it wasn't. I reached the terminal pay for my ticket and go to the waiting area. You can't enter the waiting area unless you have proof of a ticket purchase. Well, guess who comes down the escalator? Mr. Dog Tax himself. My heart sank. There were a couple of people in the waiting area, so I wasn't too worried about my immediate safety, but I was more worried about having to be trapped on a ferry boat with this guy for two hours. He paced up and down the walkway outside the washrooms, repeatedly checking to see if I'd moved, briefly ducking into the men's room and coming back out after a couple of minutes. He goes up and down the escalator a few times and continued to try to catch my eye, either smiling or just staring. I'd had enough at this point and started looking for other passengers that I could sit with for security. I see a woman in her mid-forties, and my teenage instinct to seek maternal security kicks in. I bring my bag and politely ask this woman if I can sit with her. I quietly explain what was happening, and this woman goes full mama bear, bless her soul. She told me she'd noticed the man too and got a bad feeling. She had two daughters around my age. She insisted I sit with her on the ferry too, just in case. The girl sitting across from us in the seating area overheard and offered her support as well. We boarded the ferry together, and I didn't notice the man as we boarded. I assumed he had left the terminal, as he said he never intended to catch the ferry in the first place. As we're seating on the ferry, my heart drops when I see him coming towards our seating area. The nice mom assures me she'll handle it if he dares approach us but he notices that I'm not alone anymore and I guess decides to do a lap instead. We later saw him try to bother another young girl, but luckily her boyfriend returned from the food line and the guy took off pretty fast. For the rest of the ferry, he was just sort of lurking, checking in to see if I'd gotten up or left my group. I did not, even though I had to pee really bad. It wasn't worth it. The girl we were with eventually flags down a ferry worker and informs him of this suspicious individual. Dog Tag hightails it to the other side of the vessel. When we reached the other side, the mom insisted on walking me directly to my dad's car in the pickup zone before leaving the terminal herself. And that was the end of it, thankfully. I wish that woman nothing but wonderful things in her life. She was so kind and protective. I genuinely don't know how the evening would have played out without her. I don't know what this man's plan was, but being followed on two forms of transportation 
is definitely a new one for me. This happened a few years ago, but I sometimes still think about her. I'm earning my wage through college by performing in cabaret shows in semi-big cities. My parents help me out from time to time, but it is enough to buy groceries and pay bills. Also, I don't really have a filter in what I tell people, just in case you're wondering why I told the woman anything at all. I was on my way to the train station to take the train a few towns over for one such cabaret show, and I was in a bus at the time. I was listening to music on my phone and had my earplugs in when the bus stopped at my station. There was a middle-aged woman, I'd say maybe in her fifties, immediately at the door outside to get in, and I felt her looking at me. Okay, it happens. I have a clothing style that is unique enough to earn me looks from time to time. When the bus door opened, I got out and the woman turned with me, tapping my shoulder. She told me her name was Leslie. Excuse me, she said. Yes, I replied, taking out my earbuds. I just wanted to say you have such a unique style and it really stands out. I love it. You look like you're really creative, she said. She was seemingly really genuine, and I was pretty happy about the compliment. I didn't really think about the fact that Leslie was about to get onto the bus, but then didn't as she was talking to me now. Oh, that's so sweet of you, thank you. And yes, I earn my wage doing cabaret, so you're kind of right. Oh, that's so interesting. Gotta keep an eye out for posters here in town then. She said. Yes, I'm on stage here quite often. In two months, the town over, for example. Also tonight, but it's the other town over. Oh, sounds like you're about to have a great evening. She replied. Yes, I am. The people are wonderful. Then I'm coming with you. She told me. Now hold on. Wasn't she just on the way somewhere? This was also when I realized that she didn't get onto the bus I got off of, and that this bus had already driven off. Uh, weren't you about to go somewhere? Yes, to my friend's birthday, but I'll cancel. This sounds way more fun. Wait a minute, she had some place to be and just randomly decided to cancel her plans and come out with me. Onto the train with a person less than half her age and drive three towns over, where, by the way, there was no way for her to come home afterwards. I had a place to sleep there for the night, but she wouldn't have. You won't be able to come here afterwards. There's no train that late at night. I have a place to sleep. And she stared silent. She looked as if she started thinking, and I thought that she changed her mind for a second. But then she smiled again. It's fine. I, uh, have a son living there. I don't exactly know what she said there anymore, but I know that it was something to that effect, and that I immediately thought she was lying. At this point, I was weirded out immensely, but still not freaking out. I started walking off, since I had to get a subway still. Leslie took this as a sign of me agreeing and came with me. I know she was talking the whole way to the subway, and that she was walking pretty slowly. I didn't have to rush off to the station. I was pretty early, in fact, wanting to grab dinner on the way, which I mentally wrote off at this point. But the way she held me back was by linking arms with me and holding on tight. I was freaking out at this point, but trying my hardest to stay calm. Whenever I was asked a question about myself, I was lying now. In my head, I was making plans to say I wanted to grab lunch, sitting her down at McDonald's and making a break for it. But Leslie beat me to an opportunity to bail. Sitting at the subway station, there was a pretty well-known homeless person of our town. We'd never talked, but I knew his face and he'd always been polite. Leslie, apparently, did know him and got distracted immediately, letting go of my arm. Oh, hi, John. 
How are you? You doing good? Oh, hi. I'm doing my best, but stuff is shitty at the moment. Oh, you always say that. It's like I always tell you. You gotta. I didn't stay around to hear the conversation and started jogging, then running, inside the train station. I didn't want to stop for dinner anymore, afraid that Leslie would find me again, so I immediately got the train. It would be heading off in 15 minutes, which freaked me out even more since she would have plenty of time to still get inside. So I did what I thought was best and hid in the train toilet, until it drove off. Then, and only then, I got out and sat down. I had to change trains once and felt watched the entire time, but Leslie was gone. She didn't appear at the town over and at the cabaret show. I told the story to my colleague who called my best friend, who both helped me calm down. I never saw Leslie again, and today I think she might just have been lonely or confused. But I don't care to find out. When I was in third grade, there was this girl in my class. She wasn't particularly liked by anyone, as she was quite the bully and overall a rude person, even to adults. She was known to have anger issues and get mad at people for what seemed like no reason. I was no exception. Her name was Carly. She'd been mean to me in the past, but that didn't deter me from going to her house one day after she'd been nice to me all day at school. Naive, I know. So, before leaving school that day, I called my mom to ask if I was allowed to go to Carly's house. She said yes, and to call her when I get there, so I can give her the address. Now when I think back, I wonder if she had a bad feeling about the situation, since she doesn't normally ask for the address, and she wasn't picking me up since Carly's house was about two blocks away. When I got there, after calling my mom of course, Carly insisted on making me look pretty, aka wetting my hair and brushing it. I let her. Then she told me to close my eyes and that she was taking me to the living room. I closed my eyes and she began to guide me towards the bathtub. We were already in the bathroom, so the tub was a solid two feet away from where we were standing. I opened my eyes just enough to see where she was guiding me. My foot hit the side of the tub and I said that this didn't feel like the living room. She said that it was, and that I just need to step over the gate. I tell her that I know this is the bathtub. She stops trying to get me into the tub and brings me to the kitchen instead. She says she's going to make cereal. I was standing behind her when she reached into a dishwasher and said she was grabbing a spoon. The way that she clarified that she was grabbing a spoon immediately told me what she was really going to grab and it was for sure not a spoon. I can still remember the feeling of dread that overcame me when she said those words. She pulls out a large knife and backs me up into a corner, holding the knife only inches away from my neck. I can't remember if any words were exchanged during this. Maybe I was just too shocked to say anything. I only stayed there for maybe 30 seconds before I pushed her aside and ran towards the door. I grabbed my backpack and put on my winter boots. By the time I had my boots on, Carly was trying to block the sliding door. I pushed past her again and flung open the door. I ran down her patio steps and out her front gate, not bothering to close it. I just wanted to get home to where I was safe. I remember her yelling at me as her dogs escaped through the open gate. I didn't care. One of her neighbors who was in their front lawn waved and smiled at me, clearly oblivious to what had just gone down. I ran down the road into my house, not stopping once. It wasn't until I was in the door of my house that I broke down. I began to cry and yell for my mom, my two older sisters yelling at me to shut up. My mom walked over to me 
and immediately knew there was something wrong. I explained what happened, and she was very understanding and freaked out. I can't remember if it was the same day or the next day that I had to talk to a police officer about what happened. He asked me what kind of knife it was and whatnot. I think my mom relayed most of the story to him because I don't remember having to say much. They got in contact with Carly's foster mom, and Carly got in big shit for it. At school, Carly yelled at me for getting the cops involved, and tried to guilt trip me by saying that her mom threatened to put her back into foster care if she did anything like that again. I told her I didn't care. The school was also notified about the situation, and the teachers made sure to keep an extra eye on her. But that didn't mean I wasn't paranoid around her. I made sure to keep my guard up for the rest of the school year. Which was true. She had it coming. I always thought that it was a bit extreme to involve the cops, but I ended up making Carly never mess with me again. I ended up moving after that year for unrelated reasons, only to move back before I started sixth grade. The first day of middle school, I was waiting for them to call my name so I know which class is my home room when I hear an all too familiar name. Carly. I watch as no one goes up to join the class. Was she not here? Next, I was called. I go up to join the class that she would have been in. I found out later, when the teacher was doing attendance, that she'd moved three hours away just before the beginning of the school year. It's been years since then, and I can only hope I don't see her again. But if I do, I'm not too concerned. And if she does make an appearance, I will make sure that she stays away from me. That incident has given me some trust issues. But at least now, I know how to choose my friends wisely. A few years ago, I was watching a movie at my mom's place, who at the time was staying on site at an animal rescue. The rescue was a house on a couple of acres that had been converted into a rescue. The house itself more or less functioned as a normal home, but the backyard crisscrossed with pens for the rescue animals. There were surrounding properties, but it was kilometers away from the nearest station and very difficult to reach without a car. It was about 9 p.m., post-dinner, and all manner of creatures were sleeping soundly in their beds. Most notably, two dingo cross healer dogs. These two dogs belonged to the owner and had the run of the property, sleeping in kennels on the veranda. They were little darlings once you got to know them, but quite intimidating when you first met them, grouse and all. Opening onto the same veranda was a laundry that functioned as a second kitchen, as this laundry opened from the backyard, the rescue staff kept the food, dishes, and utensils for the animals' meals in the laundry, rather than tracking mud through the house on their way to the kitchen. Anyway, we were watching the movie on my laptop. About 15 to 20 minutes into Your Next, when someone knocked at the front door. My mom immediately told me not to answer it, but when I asked why, she had no explanation. My mom has pretty great intuition, but since the dogs weren't going off, I answered anyway. I swung open the wood panel door, but left the fly screen locked as a concession to her. A soft male voice came out of the dark. The porch light apparently needed replacing. I could make out his height, about five foot nine, and his body shape, thin as hell. He had a beard and not much else. He asked for someone whose name I'd never heard. When I told him there was no one here by that name, he said he was waiting for a taxi. But then he said he needed a taxi and asked to come inside to call one. His speech was meandering. By this time, my mom had joined me by the door, pointing at the window. The door was one of those single panels with the glass windows from door to ceiling beside it. As we had the lights on inside, and it was pitch black outside, we couldn't see the caller but he had had all the time in the world to see us. Worried, she gave the caller directions to a payphone down the street. 
The caller insisted he needed to come inside to call a taxi. I insisted he use the payphone instead. He became angry and demanded we let him in. Afraid about being the only ones home that evening, my mom finally snapped and told him she'd call the police if he didn't go away, already dialing triple zero on her mobile. Eventually, he stopped arguing, and the prolonged silence suggested he was gone. Not wanting to return to the couch, which was in full view of the door's glass windows, as well as from the veranda, we occupied our time in the kitchen, waiting. We heard another knock on the door. Nervous, we peered through the window until we could make out blue and red flashing lights. We opened the door to two officers and started relaying the story. Suddenly, the officer closest to the door asked, Is this yours? We peered around the door frame. A knife lay on the windowsill. A knife my mother immediately recognized as being used for the rescue animal's meal prep. The officer said the description reminded them of a local homeless man who was known for drinking far too much and sleeping it off in people's sheds. As such, they were quick to dismiss it as a serious threat. But afterwards, my mother and I kept making creepy realizations. That knife came from the laundry in the backyard. How did this stranger get it without setting off the dogs? Without setting off any of the rescue animals? How long had he been hanging around in the backyard, getting to know the animals? Had he been watching us too? What exactly did he plan to do with that knife if we'd opened the door? I don't really want to know. A few years ago, about 2019, I was riding the bus one night to get home. There was a guy on the bus that was a little disheveled and dirty, reeked of alcohol and generally acting weird. I was sitting in the back and he sat near me and tried to talk to me. I was polite at first. I ride the bus at night a lot, so a drunk homeless guy does not bother me and I have no problem making small talk with a stranger on the bus. Plus, I'm used to there being one or two sketchy people on the bus, considering the route and the fact it's late at night. When he tried to get flirty, I politely told him I wasn't interested and put my earphones back in and ignored him. He got a little frustrated and even said some vulgar things, but I couldn't really hear him, so it was fine. It's not my first rodeo being in that kind of situation, and while it is uncomfortable and there's nothing okay about that sort of behavior, I rarely feel threatened. Most of the time they're harmless, all bark and no bite. And I'm a big girl, as in tall and overweight, and I know basic self-defense and always have an exit strategy when in scenarios where I don't feel safe. When people get like that on the bus, I find most of the time, ignoring them and acting like I'm not phased is enough for them to get bored and find something else to do. I only engage if they get in my face or start harassing other passengers, especially other women, kids, and seniors, or anyone who appears vulnerable, because I will not tolerate that, and the bus drivers usually don't put up with that either if it escalates enough. Anyway, this random, drunk homeless guy would have been just one of many random, drunk homeless guys if it weren't for what happened next. So, my stop is coming up. I'm looking forward to going home. I'm exhausted and so ready to get to bed. I pull the cord to indicate that I want to get off at the next stop, and the guy gets up and walks to the front to talk to the driver, then laughs loudly. I don't think much of it, except I'm a little wary and thinking, please don't tell me we're getting off at the same stop. As the bus slows down, I'm waiting at the back door to be let off at my stop. Instead of opening the back door, he opens the front door and the guy gets off. I ask the driver to open the back door, and I see him shake his head in the mirror. And annoyed, I walk to the front to get off there but he closes the door before I can get off and starts driving. Angry, I say. What the hell? That's my stop. 
and the driver replies, Sorry, but I can't in good conscience let you off at the same stop as that guy. Either get off at the next one, or wait until we get to a transit station and take a bus going the other way. Not getting it, I ask. Why? Because of what he said to me, he says. I ask what he said, and the driver just says, Nothing I would like to repeat. Ever. I'm so sorry, but just trust me. The driver actually looked shaken, and considering the tone of his voice and the look on his face, as frustrated and anxious as I was to get home, I trusted him and took his word for it. I caught another bus going the other way at the next terminal and watched the driver radio dispatch to get some peace officers and transit security to patrol the area near that stop. They were parked in the parking lot near the stop when I finally got off. I was extra paranoid and on high alert as I walked the couple of blocks to my apartment that night, fortunately without further incident. I never saw that guy again, and I'm okay with that. To this day, I wonder what exactly he said to the driver. It bugs me not knowing, but at the same time, maybe it's better that way. Either way, the implications are enough to have freaked me out. I've always been fascinated by all things paranormal, but there was a time in my life where I didn't totally believe. I was open to the idea of some sort of paranormal entity existing somewhere, but in my heart, I didn't really put much stock in it. Over the years, that has changed drastically. Here's one of the encounters that made me a believer. When my wife and I were newly married, we were very close with another couple who lived in our area. We would travel with them, double date with them, and we considered them our best friends. One day, they went out of town and asked us to watch their animals for them. They had a cat, a bearded dragon, a red iguana, and two rats. We agreed to watch them and they left. I worked very close to their home, so I would go over to the house once in the morning, once in the afternoon on my lunch hour, and then again in the evening. Usually, I would be alone for the morning and afternoon visit due to my job being closest to their home, and then my wife would join me for the evening visit. One day, during my afternoon visit, I purposely left the lights in their home off. They were getting enough natural light through the house to see fairly well without the lights on that day, and I wanted to save them on their electric bill while they were gone. Again, this was a conscious choice to leave their lights off, this was something I actively thought about. I did not touch their lights. After I checked on the animals, I went back to work, again leaving every light switch untouched. When my wife and I arrived back that evening, I froze in the driveway. I could see from where I was standing outside that the entryway and hallway lights were both on. I told my wife, I didn't turn those lights on. I didn't touch them. She asked me if I was sure and I told her that I was 1,000% sure. We thought that maybe someone from their HOA had come by, or one of their family members, or that someone had noticed that they were out of town and broke in. We each put a car key between our knuckles and entered the house. The house was eerily quiet. I couldn't hear any of the animals moving around, and the air felt stale, like I could have choked on it stale. We slowly made our way through the house, checking closets and looking for any sign of disturbance. Every light was on in every room that we entered. After we checked every room and absolutely nothing was out of place, we both relaxed, somewhat. I even started to gaslight myself into believing that I'd somehow turned on every single light in every single room, even the rooms I hadn't entered. Suddenly, we heard a loud thud come from the reptile room, the one we'd literally just left. The thud was loud enough that the house shook. We threw the door open, and nothing was disturbed. Nothing had fallen. Nothing had moved. Not an inch. The only thing that had changed was the bearded dragon. 
The bearded dragon's enclosure was large and positioned on the floor, with a sliding glass door front. The dragon, who had been peacefully resting when we checked just a minute before, was now rhythmically tapping its nose against the glass in a perfect pattern. Tap, 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 over and over again. It was almost robotic. I stared in disbelief. I'd never seen an animal behave like that before. I walked over to the enclosure and gently slid the glass door open. The dragon continued trying to tap on the glass, even though it was no longer there for a second or two. And then suddenly, its beard went pitch black. It scrambled out of the enclosure and took off across the floor, headed straight for the door. Luckily, my wife was able to close the door before he escaped. Once he reached the door, he started rhythmically tapping on it in the same pattern he had on the glass. Suddenly, on the other side of the door, we heard another loud thud, even louder than the first one, and in the same second, the cat started screaming, not meowing, screaming. It was a horrible sound, but I didn't have time to react before I heard clanging and clattering in the other enclosures behind me. The iguana was wildly whipping its tail against all sides of the enclosure and almost hissing. It was a horrifying sight. I quickly picked up the bearded dragon and put him back in his enclosure, and my wife grabbed for the doorknob. I'll never forget the fear and disbelief in her voice when she said, It won't open. I flew to the door and started yanking as hard as I could. The knob wouldn't even turn. It wasn't like it was broken, it was like someone was holding it from the other side. I started banging on the door and screaming, true panic setting in. My head felt fuzzy, my chest tight, and I almost thought I was going to pass out. Then, suddenly, it all stopped. The cat stopped screaming. The iguana stopped whipping, the dragon stopped tapping, and the door was easily moved. When we left that room, the rest of the lights in the house were now off. My wife and I bolted out of the house as fast as we could, and we were silent the whole drive home. The next day, I'd almost convinced myself that it was a fluke, and that the animals had upset each other. I talked to my friend to tell her about the weird experience. To which she replied, Oh, I forgot to mention, we've been having activity in the house lately. What do you mean by activity? I responded. To which she explained that the former resident of her home had been an elderly man that had passed away in the home after owning it for 40 years. She told me that ever since they'd started their renovations, she'd seen a male figure standing in the corners of their home or base of their stairs, that he would rile the animals up, and that he would often mess with the lights in the house. She said he'd never been violent, more mischievous, as if he was throwing little fits about the changes they were making. After that, I reevaluated my whole outlook on my belief in the paranormal. I sure as hell believe now. I recently moved into an apartment with my boyfriend. We instantly fell in love with the place and the price. We got approved and moved in rather quickly. The place is in a college town area. There is a bar nearby, grocery stores and fast food places. Nothing out of the ordinary nor sketchy. On the day of the move-in, our landlord gave us our keys and briefed us on the neighbors. There are only four apartments in the complex. The landlord said they are very reserved for the most part. One neighbor is very scared of COVID-19, so they stay inside. The neighbor across from us seems to be very reserved as well. Now, I saved the best for last. Our bottom floor neighbor, Cal. As we're walking up towards our place, our landlord said, Oh yeah, that's Cal. He's, uh, he's very weird. My boyfriend and I looked at each other, like what the fuck does that mean? 
His windows and doors were wide open. The landlord explained that he did not have AC at the moment. We ignored it and continued unpacking. We had prior plans to leave town, so we did not spend the first few nights there. Upon arrival, we discover why he was weird. When we first saw him, we said hello and made some comment about the weather. He seemed confused and disoriented and said, uh, yeah, okay. As the days passed, we would say hi. He would reciprocate at times. It was obvious that he was socially awkward. If I pulled up into our parking lot and he saw me, he would scurry into his room. I thought it was unusual, but brushed it off. We thought that was the extent of his weird, but boy were we wrong. Slamming, shoving, and hitting of his own doors started at night, only at night. The slamming and banging was so loud that it woke us up. When we got closer to our door, we heard him yelling. We finally understood why he was deemed weird. This continued for many nights in a row. We would notice that he just stands in the middle of the parking lot and talks to himself. If he sees me, he goes back inside. Things escalated this past week. It was late in the evening. We were chilling and watching TV when we heard a knock. We immediately knew who it was, since Cal was chilling outside with the neighbors. My boyfriend answered the door, and Cal asked if we had seen a young woman walking around. My boyfriend said no, and he walked away. Last night, I came back home from visiting my family. Immediately after I came home, Cal went upstairs, my boyfriend answered the door, and asked if we had seen his mom walking around. My boyfriend sternly said no and closed the door. To conclude, this morning at 6 a.m., we heard an extremely loud knock. I awoke immediately. I went to the door and did not see anyone, though I saw a flashlight. I got really scared and woke my boyfriend up. We looked out and saw there was a police officer looking for Cal. From what we can make out, Cal called the police due to hearing a gunshot and a young woman scream. My boyfriend was up since 5 a.m. and he stated he did not hear any of that. At this point, we're on edge with this guy. If he comes upstairs again, we're going to tell him to ask other neighbors. For an update, right as I finished writing this up, the previous tenant texted me. He stated that Cal was really weird while they lived there as well. Cal would talk to himself. The previous tenant said that he caught security camera footage of Cal going up the stairs near the door and started working out. Cal noticed the camera and went back downstairs. We will be installing cameras very soon. My boyfriend officially went into I wish this guy would mode. I also forgot to mention that yesterday before I left to visit my family, I heard someone say, Hello and shuffle around my front door. I can only imagine who it was. It creeped me out because it was right after my boyfriend left the golf. My boyfriend told me that he heard Cal go upstairs after the police left at 6 a.m. and then he said, hello, trying to get someone's attention. Yes, I know this man is mentally ill. However, it does not negate the fact that he purposely tries to talk to us in the late hours of the night. Compassion is shown, but boundaries will be set. The police were called because we heard him yell and scream for help. They came out and said they already knew about him. It seems like he's harmless, but we're still keeping our distance for our safety and his. So this happened about a year ago when I was a senior in college. It was a football game day, and after the game ended, I went to a bar with my friends for a couple of drinks, and then decided to go home. I was in bed and asleep by 10.30, because it had been a long day. At around 4.30 a.m., I woke up to a dark figure laying in bed with me, leaning over. I was so disoriented that all I managed to mutter was, What are you doing? and the guy quickly jumped over me and ran out my door, down the stairs and out the front door. 
I was in shock and so confused as to what had just happened. I lived with three other girls. Two of them had friends in town and just happened to lock their doors that night, and the other wasn't there. So what's really scary is that this man had walked all around our house and even came all the way upstairs to find my room. We called the cops and they came over to take our statements. Then, they told us that the neighbor called them 30 minutes before us and reported that she woke up to a dark figure standing in her doorway. We were all so freaked out that the five of us slept in one queen bed for the rest of the night after that. To this day, I am terrified to be home alone. They never found the guy. Really not the way I wanted to spend my Saturday morning, but sadly here we are. I'm writing this as I sit down, more scared and anxious than I ever have been, beyond belief. I'm a female who was at my friend's flat. We were with her sister and also another female friend. Lots of good vibes and laughs, just normal girly time. At some point, uh, a trusted nice guy and a bit of a simp but someone we wouldn't feel uncomfortable around, arrived. Women know what I mean, especially about the nice best friend to girl guy. Anyway, he was very approachable at first, very polite and sweet, but I was always told never to trust anyone who is nice on first appearance. It's usually overcompensation for something, or to hide something evidently darker, as I found out later on. He slowly became more argumentative and had a very patronizing, condescending tone which would rise for no reason. He acted like he was being completely normal, despite being passive-aggressive. It was a quick turn. Moving on, he attempted to take my water bottle and insisted to everyone for no reason when I took it back out of his pocket. Which is weird anyway. Who put someone else's Evian bottle in their pocket? He then insisted it was his, and that he brought it with him, and genuinely seemed to believe it was his. This was when I got a weird gut feeling something was just not quite right. We then proceeded to have a back and forth, nothing harsh said, but I told him he thinks he's the smartest person in the room, and I could see right through him. Quite an assumption to make about someone, but as a human we can sense danger. Then, to top this already slightly alarming experience, he started pulling very vulgar sex faces and hand motions, not even in a jokey way between friends. He did it every time he got the chance. He was pretending to do some weird sex motion. Needless to say, I was very disgusted, as I barely even knew him, and it wasn't in a banter type way where it was laughed off as a little one-off, but he repeatedly did it. He did this to me as no one was looking, and stood slightly behind my friend who was talking, so he could make these ugly gestures to me. He kept asking me to come back to his, and told me he wants to take me abroad, as he needs someone to look after him when drunk. I told him I'm not a babysitter in a bit of a joke way, and he straight away went very stiff and defensive. Slightest things seemed to trigger him. After being in a high alert, abusive situation for many years, sadly you recognize even more so that something in the air just isn't right. Even if you're not 100% of your gut feeling, always follow it, because it's there for a reason. There's absolutely no need for taking chances. Sadly, this world is too unkind. Anyway, my friend had gone to bed, my friend's sister was getting ready to leave, but I was very reluctant to be left alone with him for obvious reasons. She ordered a taxi and asked him to walk her out to it. He agreed, and I told him very bluntly I'm locking him out, and his immediate response in a very nonchalant manner was, Yeah, I would. That for some reason was what made me double down wholeheartedly on making sure I locked him out. Despite my friends maybe getting upset, I've locked another friend out. I wasn't too concerned about what they would say, as I knew in my heart this man had ill intentions. 
I got the vibe he was pre-warning me, a bit like an animal playing with his food before eating. He was enjoying being weird and making me uncomfortable. As he walked out the door with my friend, I immediately locked the door. And thank you, God and Jesus above, that I locked the door, as usually I would forget. But in this instance, I am forever grateful I turned the lock. Thinking I was free of this weird creep, I heard talking at the door, and someone trying to slightly push it open. I told him I was feeling scared and don't feel comfortable at all in his presence. I called him a weirdo and a creep, and his response was, I'm not that weird. But he said it in an inquisitive way, like he was trying to convince himself, and not at any point did he take offense to my dramatic accusations and labels. I told him he had suppressed sexual urges, and that he won't be taking them out on me. He then proceeded to say, Oh, but not in a cute way. It was in a very apathetic, weird tone. Even in these interactions, I was panicking more, because instead of just thinking he was a run-around normal creep, I was digging into something much weirder and darker. He proceeded to attempt to open the door again, begging just to talk to me for two minutes, and weirdly enough, I couldn't make out if it was actually him through the door as I had bad eyes, but I knew it was him, obviously due to the conversation we had. He stood outside for 15 minutes, pretending to book a taxi, and he kept repeating that our mutual friend was gone. He then left, and I was on high alert. I was standing by the door, and out of nowhere, I saw a white guy. The original guy was not white, so I noticed it wasn't the same person. He walked straight over to the door and covered the peephole with his thumb. This made my heart literally quiver. I was genuinely scared for my safety in a way that was very unsettling, and I hope no one else feels that fear. But those that know, your heart just sinks in this horrible way. The door was the only thing separating me from this utter evil predator. What made it so weird is that he was attempting to get a friend to come round and that we should all go out to the town. It's weird, as no one was dressed for such outings. But looking back, that second guy who came to the door ever so randomly and covered the peephole looked like he left something on the floor. But I'm obviously not going outside to check, as I panicked so bad, I don't remember if I saw him leave the little hallway or communal entrance but I'm not sure if he did. I woke my friend to tell her. She could see I was so scared. I told her what happened, and she said she's never had anything like this happen, and how she doesn't know an older white guy, saying that she's a 24-year-old Jamaican woman and just doesn't happen to know any middle-aged white guys. It wouldn't have been so scary, but the way he just came right to the door and immediately covered the peephole, it was like he knew someone would be looking through there. I believe maybe this was connected, because what are the odds of this happening so close to each other in about a 10 minute difference and not have some form of connection? Either way, please remember to lock your doors. It saves lives as simple as it is. If that door had opened when he attempted due to being unlocked, who knows what I would have endured. I've never had anything this creepy happen, and I live in a big city, and I have a slightly unconventional lifestyle, so I have seen it all. People are very dangerous. Please be aware, if you feel something isn't right, it's not. This was about seven years ago on a dark stretch of road near a main intersection in a major Bay Area city. I worked at a big name, healthy grocery store from 2014 to 2017. I was lucky to meet and work with amazing co-workers, some of whom have become my best and closest friends. One of my best friends, Cav, is one of the nicest, most caring people I've ever met. 
He's incredibly generous, genuine and warm, and welcoming to everyone. Sometimes to a fault. I'm a female, and at the time of this story I was in my early 20s, and Cav is a guy and he was in his late 20s. Cav and I had a weekly ritual of driving around the city after work and talking, sometimes about our problems, sometimes about what was going well, but it was therapeutic and always something to look forward to. This particular night, we invited our buddy Ben to join us. His department always got out 30 to 45 minutes after the rest of the store, so Cav and I decided we would do a short drive around the area to pass the time until Ben was off. Cav was driving that night. We did our drive and were headed back to the store to pick up Ben. In order to get back to the store, we needed to make a U-turn at a four-way intersection. To get to the intersection, we had to go down a dark but short stretch of road. The intersection is well lit, always busy, and has a shopping center plaza on each side. From the dark stretch of road, it's exactly 302 feet to the main well lit and ever busy intersection. As we're driving down the dark section, Cav suddenly interrupts what I was saying and says, Oh my god, did you see that person waving? He slows down the car as I look back. No, what are you talking about? I ask. You didn't see them. There was someone in a black hoodie waving us down. I'm looking back. I have poor eyesight. It's dark. No, I don't see anyone. There's no one there. As I'm saying this, Cav is pulling into an empty parking lot parallel to the dark stretch of road. He reaches to the back seat and is moving jackets and other stuff off the seat, obviously making room for this person. No, Cav, I said. No one is getting in this car. Do you understand? But what if they need- No, there's no one there. And if there were, they could walk up to the intersection. No. He agrees, but insists we continue to circle around and check. I reluctantly agree but realize I have no choice anyway. We circle back, and sure enough, there's a girl, roughly in her early 20s, standing alone, wearing all black. She looks disheveled and is sort of crying, maybe. Cav rolls down the passenger window halfway and asks her if she's okay. She seems off. I immediately have awful vibes from her. Four guys stole my purse, she says, with her hands over her face. It had my wallet. I literally lost everything, and I don't have a phone. The weirdest thing about this is that she wasn't crying. She was stretching her words out and whining, but she wasn't crying. I said, okay, we'll call the police for you. Why don't you walk up to the plaza at the main intersection? We'll wait with you for the police. No, she says adamantly. It won't help. I already called the police an hour ago. This is when I started to freak out. She just said she didn't have a phone. She's been standing in the dark for an hour. I thought you didn't have a phone, I said. I do, but it's dead, she replied back. All of this happening rapid fire, and before I can really mentally get into what's going on, Cav tells her to get in the car so we can help her. I say, walk up to the plaza and we'll help you. Cav unlocks the door and says, no, don't worry, we'll drive you there. The girl has her hands in the front pocket of her hoodie and gets into the car. I'm pissed, fuming. The girl's acting really weird. I remember at this point that I have my box cutter on me. I reach down, into my backpack, and I'm rummaging through my stuff to find it. Cav is talking to her, but everything she says is contradictory. She says that she isn't from this area, has no idea where she is, yet she tells us she grew up and lives about six blocks away. As we're driving, she says she wants to go to a particular bar, that she could really use a drink. I thought you don't have your wallet or ID, I ask. 
I keep looking for my box cutter, and I'm looking back at her. She has a waxy complexion, and looks me in the eyes as if she's looking through me. It gives me the creeps. Cav is incredibly kind to her, the idiot, and keeps saying positive things, trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. While this is happening, I find my box cutter, open it all the way, and hold it in my lap. I turn my back and keep my eyes on her. She tells us she has a boyfriend nearby and asks us to take her there. She and Kev continue to talk and she says she was kicked out of her parents' house. Her hands still remain in her pocket and mine remains holding the box cutter. Because of this whole ordeal, we've totally forgotten about Ben. Still watching her, I pull my phone out and call him. I'm explaining to Ben what's happening, and in a matter of seconds, she went from asking us for money and alcohol, and saying weird shit, to just wanting to get out of the car. We did not drop her at her boyfriend's house, but a few streets away in a random neighborhood. We drop her off, and there's silence for a few seconds in the car. Oh my god, Cap says, laughing. She could have robbed us or killed us. Yeah, idiot. I'm 100% certain, at the very least, she was planning to rob us. Looking back, there's so much I would have done differently. We were lucky nothing happened. But I am positive that there was evil in that car that night. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening. And thank you to my channel members and patrons. Killian's Place April James Arterburn Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Drakkard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.